crude cartoons of the Canadian wilds. Hector Charlesworth, Saturday night. The hot mush school. The advanced atomizers who spray a tube of paint at a canvas and call it sunshine on a cow shed. Toronto Daily Star. The elements? Hungarian goulash. Rock and maple. <laughs> Drunkard stomach. Rather like a Christmas tree nightmare, which might have visited Scrooge. Toronto Telegram. In the first third of this century, seven men conspired to alter the face of a nation, to change the way people looked at the land around them, to unlock the energies hidden within water and sky, rocks and trees in ways not seen before. To do this, they assaulted a fortress of tradition, of skepticism, of ignorance. The Group of Seven. Art for a Nation. It began with a young nation held tightly in the grip of a colonial past. It began with a European aesthetic forged over centuries of careful evolution bound by the cultural and social systems of those who immigrated here. It began, as all good revolutions do, with the powerful, entrenched elite. Canadian painters still look to Europe for initiative, and the inspiring associations that the artist life of the old world alone can provide. The Art Chronicle, 1910. An infant country can put forth only an infant life and an infant life, only an infant art. Its value is not in achievement, but in promise, which is precisely the value of all Canada. Basil King, the Canadian Forum. An awakening. Among these few Canadian artists, the nucleus of the Group of Seven is already taking shape. Some will meet at commercial graphics firms in Toronto, where they were employed before the Great War. For more than a decade, their interests, their philosophies, their feeling for the land will converge and their abilities will grow. I first met J.E.H. MacDonald at the Arts and Letters Club in Toronto. His sketches contained intimations of something new in painting in Canada, an indefinable spirit which seemed to express the country more clearly than any painting I had yet seen. Lorne Harris. You have only to look over the catalogues of our exhibitions, and you will see trails crawling all over Europe. Spring in Versailles, autumn on the Riviera, ye gods. A.Y. Jackson. May 1913. A.Y. Jackson comes to meet MacDonald, Arthur Lismer, and Fred Farley at the Arts and Letters Club. An exciting forum of ideas and opinions, the club provides fertile ground for the expression of the most radical concepts and for the most spirited responses. I was astonished, disgusted at not only the artificiality, but the primitivism of those paintings. You sound like that American reactionary, Cox. He says, I see in these paintings all the worst aspects of the so-called post-impressionists, cubists, and futurists. They are not the result of a sincere artistic impulse, but of an over-exaggerated individualism, a lack of discipline, and driven by a keen sense not of beauty, but of publicity and commercialism. Commercialism? We're lucky if we sell two paintings in a show. We must be stirred by big emotions, born of our landscape. The great pioneer spirit which animated the explorers and soldiers. Free from the luminous post-impressionists, the blight of futurism, and the other queer foul in France. Canadian artists should not even educate themselves abroad. But internationalism in art is the basis of all art. However, national... To Lorne Harris, art was almost a mission. He believed that we, a young, vigorous people who had pioneered in so many ways, should put the same spirit of adventure into the cultivation of the arts. It was exciting to meet such a man, A.Y. Jackson. In 1913, the artists moved into the studio building on Severn Street in the Rosedale Ravine. 
This was the first building in Canada constructed specifically for artist studios. Not, it was said, a place for pink teas or tango, but a place to produce pictures. But the sheer bigness of their sense of the land cannot be contained within the studio walls. It will expand to encompass an ambition of enormous breadth and scope. The way it ought to be. Thompson, West Ungava, McDonald, Georgian Bay Islands, Harris, those godforsaken Laurentian hills, all look after the Labrador coast. Then we would have a Canadian school for sure. A.Y. Jackson. When your up-to-the-moment artist decides to wreak his soul on the canvas, he takes a rifle and a paddle and hikes for the northern woods. He can't work in peace unless he has a bear trying to steal his bacon or a moose breathing heavily down his neck. That's why the coming Canadian artist is such a husky beggar. Peter Donovan, Saturday night. It is fortunate that the artists are made of such stern stuff, for events of profound and far-reaching consequences will soon burst upon them. In the summer of 1917, Private A.Y. Jackson, serving with the 60th Battalion, Canadian Expeditionary Forces, will receive devastating news. Tom Thompson is found drowned at Canoe Lake in his beloved Algonquin Park. Foul play is not indicated, and everyone agrees that Thompson would have been the last to take his own life. The mysteries surrounding his death will persist. It is hard to assess the magnitude of Thompson's contribution to the Group of Seven and the severity of his loss. The others have been deeply moved by his superb talent and his personality. The earliest members will continue to think of him as a motive force and as one of their number. The war continues, shattering the old order, sweeping aside the comfortable conventions, reshaping the character of all who encounter it. And in the midst of cruelty and devastation and pain, small victories are won. On this last trip, I made little more than pencil notes. Found it hard to manage a sketch box while shells were dropping here and there. You'd be proud of the Canucks if you could see them. Well, send Jim over. I wish Tom had lived to show us what he could do. Sincerely, Alex Jackson. You in Canada cannot realize at all what war is like. You must see it and live it. You must see your own countrymen thrown into a cart, their coats over them, boys digging a grave in a land of yellow slimy mud and green pools of water under a weeping sky. Fred Varley. Thompson dead, Europe in ruins. Those who remain seem to draw strength from it, assimilating the horror and the loss, and incorporating them into their vision of a greater and more idealistic existence. It is a strength that will be sorely taxed. This year, Mr. Harris has pressed the very brightest tubes upon his palate and has let his brush, knife, trowel, shovel, or whatever tool he has used run away with itself. The Toronto Daily Star. The river is wild. So wild you would never dream it was a river unless the catalog vouched for the fact. Not only the river, but the trees, the rocks, everything is equally wild and all look as though they were badly in need of sorting out and tidying up. The Toronto Daily News. Even A.Y. Jackson, whose belief in the movement and singleness of purpose verges on the legendary, will have moments of intense frustration. The art of picture making for a living has become more or less ridiculous. The average painter would be better employed at a carpenter's wage designing house decoration. By May of 1920, a collective will has brought them together. Their first exhibition opens in the Art Gallery of Toronto. The catalogue records 121 pieces, mostly, though by no means exclusively, landscape. 
alone among the reviewers in identifying the works with the Canadian North is the Canadian Courier's Augustus Bridal. Seven men go the record limit, interpreting North Country landscapes in colors that make the rainbow look like the wrong side out. Symbolism mixes with jazz, realism with old-fashioned beauty. Is this radical eruption the Canadian art of the future? Lorne Harris's paintings, all so different they might have been done by four individual painters. Harris paints with a sort of ecstasy of ideas. If there is a leader in the group, Harris is it. Raised in a background of privilege, he uses his connections and his fortune with discreet sensitivity to sustain their painting while exploring his own spectacular gift. J.E.H. MacDonald goes at a thing from the inside out. He seems anxious to know by the anatomical method what made the creator fashion such big things and how he felt when he was doing it. Cerebral, quiet, with a deft wit, MacDonald is the poet of the group. Years of stress from family responsibilities and finances will irretrievably damage his health. Frank Johnson, the most opulent, has a prodigious fancy, a wonderful eye, and an imagination that is not often obsessed with metaphysical ideas. Johnson, a superb colorist and draftsman, is a speedy worker and a voluble companion. Although he has been painting with the group for years, he has doubts about its benefits for his career. Fred Varley is the dour, emotional Yorkshireman who Ibsenizes in paint. Passionate, unconventional, Bohemian, Varley is an unsettling influence on most who meet him. Arthur Lismer is as yet rather indeterminate. Most of his work shows a struggle of ideas when the more simple statement of one idea would have been more effective. Like Varley, Lismer has emigrated from Sheffield in England. He will campaign tirelessly for a greater art consciousness among all Canadians and entertains his colleagues with his vitality and charm. Franklin Carmichael, the youngest of the group, has a simple enchantment with color for its own sake. The diminutive Carmichael, gentle and contemplative, sacrifices much to the pursuit of art. He alone would continue to work in commercial art firms to support his young family. A.Y. Jackson is different from all the rest, but somehow, like every one of them, a pioneer in the group. Quebec-born, mercurial, the self-educated standard bearer of the group, Jackson is a loyal friend and a caustic opponent. Practically impervious to physical hardship, his path will cross and recross the continent. The seven group have made people think. They go direct to nature. Their aim in art is greater virility, and they have got it. Augustus Bridal, the Canadian Courier. On balance, the reviews of the first exhibition of the Group of Seven are mixed, as is the public reception. Visitors, 2,146. Total sales, six. Characteristically, Harris, Jackson, and Lismer will have departed to paint in Algoma before the exhibition is over. Nonetheless, they have defined themselves. They have a name, a following, and a body of work. The struggle for identity is approaching its resolution. The struggle for acceptance has only just begun. With the modest claim of Eric Brown, director of the National Gallery of Canada, a slightly modified exhibition goes on the road to the United States. The best exhibition of modern Canadian painting ever seen. Reaction ranges from a somewhat Puritan distaste in Boston to remarkable enthusiasm in Buffalo, with various whistle stops in between. Realizing that the opinions of our critics and collectors meant nothing, a number of our more venturesome painters started to exhibit outside of Canada, where they were unknown, and where their work had to hold its own or sink. A.Y. Jackson. I should judge, by comparing our own show with a fine collection of American pictures recently shown here, but we Canadians are developing a rather cold austerity of character. 
which may be uninviting, however noble, J.E.H. MacDonald. The group of seven strives to paint Canada as it is. The wilds with the tangle of underbrush, the streams, the lakes and islands, and the hard, sharp distances. The Buffalo Evening News. We believe wholeheartedly in the land. Someday, we think that the land will return the compliment and believe in the artist. Not as a nuisance or a luxury, but as a real civilizing factor in the national life. Lorne Harris. A second show was assembled. Once again, however, the critical response is less positive than might be desired. Although I am somewhat dismayed by Harris's frankly neurotic studies of color and form, phantom trees that never grew, distorted nightmares of deadwood and much else, I find Jackson swinging back to a rather more comfortable idea. MacDonald, in his Algoma tapestry period. Lismer seems to have made decisive advances since last year and Carmichael is producing exquisite ecstasies of beautiful color. I especially like Varley's smashing epic in bravura style, an audacious attempt to express the power of a gale on a foreground tree, a vast, uneasy stretch of multicolored lake and a dazzling mineralogical sky. Augustus Bridal, the Toronto Daily Star. I find these artists glory in ugliness. I miss the work of Frank Johnson. He never quite fitted with the work of the other men with whom he was associated. Fred Jacob, The Mail and Empire. Already the group has changed. Frank Johnson, worried that his sales will be damaged by association with the group, participates only in the first exhibition. A twanging, clanging carnival of color. Augustus Bridal, the Toronto Daily Star. As weird a show as any reformed opium eater craving for a momentary return to the old thrills could wish. Hector Charlesworth, Saturday night. The artists invite adverse criticism. Indifference is the greatest evil they have to contend with. J.E.H. MacDonald. As the existing work circulates, bringing in a wider audience, more is on the way. Back in Toronto, canvas and board are by no means the only surfaces that feel the touch of the group's energetic brushes. St. Anne's Church is illuminated with color. The Reverend Paul is a good Canadian, but apparently he does not know the good Canadians do not get their mural decorating done at home and Hart House at the university receives a dramatic boost in the form of powerful set design at the hands of several members. It becomes clear that the opinions of the group are widely reflected in the artistic community. Merrill Dennison, playwright. The worst influence on our culture is academic ennui that sucks away the enthusiasm, the vitality, the joy of experimentation that should be the heritage of the Canadian. Still, old habits die hard. Ernest Fosbury's Affie, daughter of the artist, painted in this period with traditional technique, evokes a predictable response. Her boa stands out so clearly that it looks like real fur instead of a painted picture of it. Letter to the Gazette. In all probability, the members of this particular group will be forced to exhibit in the United States and forget the Canadian audience, which should be there for them, but is not. Perhaps okayed by New York, their work may wander home long after they're dead and be prized, not because it's good or because it's Canadian, but because some other country was told that it was Canadian and said it was good. Merrill Dennison. Dennison's bleak view, although extreme, is not wholly divorced from the truth. It will be the judgment of another nation that finally leads to a wider acceptance of the Group of Seven.
The British Empire Exhibition invites the best from the dominions and colonies for critical and public inspection. Our ultimate desire is to include the finest representation of Canadian art it is possible to get together. Eric Brown, National Gallery. A jury consisting of artists is assembled to select Canada's contribution. They decide that less than 10% of the work should be by the Group of Seven and Tom Thompson. Even these are dispatched amidst a storm of controversy. If the walls of the Canadian section are to be covered with crude cartoons of the Canadian wilds, it's going to be a bad advertisement for this country. We should advise the Department of Immigration and Colonization to intervene to prevent such a catastrophe. Hector Charlesworth, Saturday night. But the reviews, although slightly patronizing in tone, still are exceptionally positive. It is here, of all the dominions, that the note is what we understand by modern. Very emphatic, a little crude, leaving plenty of room for refinement without loss of character. The London Times. The Canadian landscapes, I think, are the most vital group of paintings produced since the war. Indeed, this century. It would be a graceful and fraternal gesture if we acquired two or three for the Tate Gallery. Lewis Hind, The Daily Chronicle. Opposition has not died, but there is a new respect, a clearer willingness to look at the merits of the work, a greater capacity to experience the dialectic of land and vision than has been present before. I felt as if the Canadian soul were unveiling to me something secret and high and beautiful and a mysticism I had not suspected. Salem Bland, the Toronto Daily Star. It is a vindication an affirmation of the principle that has inspired them. Art is not a profession practiced, but a way of life, Arthur Lismer. It is a spirit that has arisen elsewhere, attracting the attention of artists and anthropologists alike, and it re-echoes in the consciousness of the group. The National Museum's Marius Barbeau. Our plan is to exhibit jointly a considerable number of West Coast Indian carvings and a certain number of modern paintings by Canadian artists, which might serve as an interesting background to the Indian art motifs. Miss Emily Carr Victoria has made interesting paintings. Their vision has radiated outwards, resonating in the work of new artists. A.J. Casson has been accepted into the group to fill the void left by Frank Johnson, and other talents are being nurtured and encouraged. To Eric Brown, National Gallery, Ottawa. Dear Mr. Brown, if it had not been for you and the group of seven, I would surely be sunk into oblivion. Sarah Robertson. In later years, it will be the Canadian group of painters, among others, who will inherit this mantle of collaboration and the ardent conviction that burns alongside it. The legacy is by no means theirs alone. The growth of a love for beauty and the fine arts is one of the essential ways of revealing a nation's ideals. Arthur Lisma. The creative artist is the custodian of the future fame of his own country. Lauren Harris. From Glace Bay to the Coast Mountains and from Ellesmere Island to the 49th parallel, they discover their subjects. Not simply the land, but the act of perception itself is transformed, articulated, brought home to their audience. New expressions of color, new textures and surfaces, new emotions. The blow from which the group cannot recover comes in 1932, the death of James Edward Hervey MacDonald, Herald's disbandment. Although Edwin Holgate and Lemoyne Fitzgerald briefly hold membership, it is time to move on. The group has seen vast transformations in its pursuit of the special quality that informs their nation. Their influence has spread widely, and the remaining members will continue, but their association is complete. In a brief dozen years, they have created, as none could have done alone, a Canadian art. Cedar, 
and jagged fur uplift sharp barbs against the gray and cloud-piled sky. And in the bay, blown spume and windrift and thin bitter spray snap at the whirling sky, and the pine trees lean one way. This is a beauty of dissonance, this resonance of stony strand. This smoky cry curled over a black pine like a broken and wind-battered branch when the wind bends the tops of the pines and curdles the sky from the north. This is the beauty of strength, broken by strength, and still strong. A.J. M. Smith, The Lonely Land, 1936. Thank you. 